Muhammad Ali, boxer, Olympic gold medalist and the first fighter to win the linear heavyweight title three times. Muhammad Ali, star, a jive-talking showman who had reporters eating out of the palm of his hand. Muhammad Ali, humanitarian, who gave cause to his countrymen to reflect on their nation and place in the world. Muhammad Ali has always been more than a great boxer, more than a superb athlete. He took what he had and he made the world a better place. Well, Ali has sort of captured less our imagination, which he did 40 years ago in the, Olymp the Olympics at Rome, and 30 years ago when he came back for the greatest fight in the last almost half century. But because of a movie, because of books, as I've put out, because of the attention, and because maybe we need somebody. Louisville, Kentucky. It's often said that it's either the northernmost southern city or the southernmost northern city in the United States. Muhammad Ali was born here in January 1942. Now he's one of Louisville's favorite sons, but he grew up in a city still racially segregated according to America's Jim Crow laws. His parents, Cassius Nodessa, named him Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. The family lived in a clapboard house at 3302 Grand Avenue. It's still there, and so is Lawrence Montgomery, a neighbor of the Clays. He remembers that the young boy who lived next door was something special, even back then. I was working in post office at night, and he would always uh, help me to hold up my hands so he could spare into my hands. He'd always do that every morning. Before he, then he would run to school. He would run beside the bus. He wouldn't get on the bus. He would always want to run. But he told me then that he would be the heavyweight, heavyweight champion one of these days. And sure enough, he was. The future heavyweight champion used to spar under this cedar tree and started boxing so that he'd be ready if ever he came across the thief who stole a treasured bicycle. He told the story to reporters in Rome after winning the Olympic light heavyweight gold medal. My bicycle was stolen and my cousin was a boxer. He wasn't too successful, but he boxed. And he told me that uh, he would train me if I ever catch the guy that, you know how kids think, if I ever caught the guy that stole my bicycle, well, he would, uh, I would know how to fight. You know, I could defend myself. Well, uh, anyway, he took me to the gym and he quit later, but I kept it up. Did you catch the guy who stole your bike? I never did. During his six year amateur career, he registered 100 wins and five losses. He competed in the famous Golden Gloves Tournament, where the winners of regional competitions go on to fight at national level. His record includes six Kentucky Golden Gloves titles, two national Golden Gloves titles, and an Amateur Athletics Union national title. However, Olympic gold is the greatest prize for an amateur, and a medal at the Games often opens the way to a professional career. So it was for Ali when he defeated Poland's Zbigniew Pechukowski in Rome in 1960. But that medal is the subject of an enduring story told today at the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville. The city was a different place in 1960 and it said that Ali was refused service at a segregated eatery when he returned home after winning Olympic gold for the United States. Hey you, what you doing in here? You know I can't serve you, now leave. The disgusted Ali threw his gold medal into the Ohio River. A display at the Ali Center educates visitors about segregated life in Louisville in 1960. There are those who suggest that events didn't quite unfold in the way that Ali described in his autobiography, but he was presented with a replacement medal at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, where he had the honored role of lighting the torch to officially start the games. 29th of October, 1960, Louisville. Cassius Clay versus Tunney Hunsaker. It was the Olympic champion's first professional bout. 
Fonseca was not only a pro boxer, but the police chief of Fayetteville, West Virginia, the youngest man to have held such an office in the state's history, and certainly no pushover. The night went to Ali with a unanimous decision in the sixth round, and Hunziker found himself on the receiving end of the distinctive style that came to be famously described by Ali as, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The orthodox approach for a heavyweight was to keep the hands high to defend the face and head. Ali was quick, carried his hands low, and used fast footwork to avoid blows. In his autobiography, Hunziker recalled Ali's lightning speed and one of the hardest body blows he'd ever taken. After the fight, he told a friend he was sure that this Cassius Clay would go on to be world champion. By March 1963, Ali had won each of his 18 bouts with five knockouts, nine TKOs. His April 1961 match against Lamar Clark saw him defeat an opponent who had won his last 40 engagements by knockout. He was also building a reputation as the Louisville Lip, brashly and correctly predicting the round in which he'd win. It was a perfect technique for the emerging age of television, and it became as much of a trademark as his footwork and punches. In late May 1963, Ali ventured to London for his first professional fight outside the United States. He was to take on Henry Cooper at Wembley Stadium. Cooper had a left hook nicknamed Henry Zammer. A similar punch from Sonny Banks had floored Ali in February 62. 35,000 fans saw an aggressive Cooper win the first round. The Americans started looking the goods in the second and third, opening cuts above Cooper's eyes. The fourth saw the Briton deliver his devastating left, with Ali literally saved by the bell. But fast, accurate punches from Ali in the fifth drew streams of blood from Cooper's cuts. A win by technical knockout for Ali, but something of a scare at a time when he was emerging as a title contender. Not even that big, ugly, bear son in Is he your next fight? Well, after I annihilate this Henry Cooper, I want that bear. And what's going to happen to him? him bear. What's going to happen to him? He might be great, but he'll fall in eight. Ali's first title fight was against Sonny Liston, a formidable champion with a long reach and notably large fists, who'd served time in prison for robbery. He'd won the WBA, WBC World Heavyweight Championship with a first round knockout against Floyd Patterson in 1962. His bout with Ali was set for February the 25th, 1964 in Miami Beach. Ali dominated, aside from a period during the fourth round when his eyes were aggravated by some unknown substance, the nature of which remains debated to the present day. After the sixth round, Liston told his corner that he couldn't go on due to a shoulder injury. Ali was now the heavyweight champion of the world. He retained the WBC title in the May 65 rematch. Liston was knocked out in the first round, although some maintained that he stayed on the canvas to throw the fight for one reason or another. But he was stripped of the WBA title. After his first bout with Liston, the man still known to the wider world as Cassius Clay announced that he was a member of the Nation of Islam, often called the Black Muslims in contemporary news reports. In March of 1964, he took the name Muhammad Ali. These were religiously and racially charged times in the United States, as the ideals of the civil rights movement clashed head-on with segregation laws that lingered in some parts of America. The teachings of the Nation of Islam swayed somewhat from moderate to controversial stands, reflecting the changing views of its leadership and its volatile position at the crossroads of race and religion at a time of great social change. It must have been difficult for anyone, let alone a celebrity athlete constantly in the public eye, to come to an understanding of their faith. In 1975, Ali embraced the Sunni denomination. His beliefs have been the key to his public life beyond the boxing ring, a man of compassion adored around the world. November 1965, Muhammad Ali is the WBC heavyweight champion of the world. He's made good on his boyhood boasts and fulfilled the promise that others had seen in him. Ali fought Floyd Patterson in Las Vegas in his second title defense. Patterson was a former champion and hoped to be the first man to win the heavyweight title three times. He lost by technical knockout towards the end of the 12th round. 
Ali was then to meet Ernie Terrell, who'd been awarded Ali's stripped WBA title in March 1966 in Toronto. However, Terrell withdrew from the engagement and Ali fought Canadian George Chuvalo, who'd finished his 93-fight career in 1979, never once having been knocked down. At the end of the full 15 rounds, Ali won by unanimous decision. After the match, the champion was quoted as saying that Chuvalo was the toughest guy he'd ever fought. Ali's cornermen were taken by the way the Canadian just kept on coming. It was around this time that the U.S. government revised its military draft classifications, and Ali was now assessed as qualified for unrestricted service. That decision set the scene for a fight every bit as tough as anything he'd encounter in the ring. Induction into the army would most likely lead to deployment to Vietnam. His growing religious understanding brought him to the belief that fighting in such circumstances was wrong, and he declared himself to be a conscientious objector. He returned to London in May 1966 to face Henry Cooper once again, this time with the WBC title at stake. He was popular with the British media, and they, by and large, respected his decision to change his name, addressing him as Muhammad, when many commentators in the US continued to refer to him as Cassius. He was unwilling to discuss the growing draft controversy at home, but talked candidly about the trademark persona he'd created. Well, all the talk, like for an example, the last time I fought Henry Coop, I was saying that he must fall in round five, and that's no job. Little rhymes, I am the greatest, I am the king. The things that I was doing, they were only campaigning to the title. I saw in 1960 when I turned professional that I had a hard way to go to beat all the top contenders, so I had to overshadow them predicting and being blessed and successful enough to fulfill my predictions and uh, <clears throat> calling the rounds and writing poems and weigh in disturbances and, and challenging my opponent on the street and this was controversial and it was colorful and it, I overshadowed all the contenders and the promoters are the ones who promote the fights and who put up the money. Well, I was a bigger draw than Eddie Machen at the time, than uh, uh, many top contenders, so this threw me right into the championship fight. And I won, but that was only campaigning. Like a mayor, a man running for some office, he walks the streets, he picks up babies, he shakes the hands, he campaigns. Then when the man is in office, uh, it's, hard, it's hard seeing him. You need a necktie, a, a suit, or an appointment. And he settles down to the right, job then. Right, so I'm in office now, I'm the heavyweight champion of the world, and I don't have to talk no more and say I'm the greatest because people tell me I'm the greatest. These promotional techniques and tactics were emulated by many others over the following decades. Muhammad Ali had changed the way fighters present themselves to the media. Before the fight, Ali made much of seeking to punish Cooper for having the temerity to knock him down in 1963. He retained the WBC title after the fight was stopped in the sixth of a scheduled 15 rounds. As in their earlier fight, cuts around the Britons' eyes began to bleed profusely. Again, Cooper was otherwise fine. It wasn't the way Ali would have wanted to win, and his comments afterwards stood in marked contrast to his Louisville lip showmanship. I just hate the, the fight ended the way it did with him uh, cut like that. I hate to see blood, and I don't like to see people hurt so bad. And it just weakened me, and I just couldn't stand the punch after I saw him bleed. And I just had to stay off of him and wait for the referee to stop it. But I think the referee should have stopped it uh, bef the minute he was cut, because it was that bad. Muhammad Ali's next two title defences saw him face Brian London in the United Kingdom and Karl Mildenberger in Germany. Perhaps spending time in Europe provided a welcome relief from the growing controversy over his conscientious objector status back in America. Continued exposure abroad, in the days before global TV sports channels, was helping to cement Ali's reputation as an international star. Brian London had a straightforward workmanlike style and was taking his second shot at a world title. But Ali's finesse saw the champ win by knockout in the third. A month later, Mildenberger foxed Ali for 11 rounds in Frankfurt, but lost by technical knockout in the 12th. Ali returned to the US in November 1966. Conscription for military service in Vietnam would ultimately divide the nation. Why should uh, me and other so-called Negroes go 10,000 miles uh, away from home here in America to drop bombs and bullets on other innocent uh, 
brown people who's never bothered us. And uh, I will say directly, no, I will not go. Ali had applied for conscientious objector status, provided for by the law, as one whose religious beliefs were incompatible with taking up arms. The U.S. Justice Department advised against granting the application, arguing that the teachings of the Nation of Islam, the black Muslims, were first and foremost political and racial rather than religious. First of all, I say it's not black Muslim, it's Muslim. Uh, Islam has no, Islam religion has no color distinction. And as far as the uh, Islamic religion here in America being recognized, I'm sure if it wasn't recognized, we wouldn't have 50 or 60 mosques throughout the United States. And also we have mosques set up in the major prisons throughout the United States, in the prisons. Shortly put, are the black Muslims taking you I for a ride? Not, I said not black Muslims, Muslims. I beg your pardon. Ali's objections to war were based on his religious beliefs, but the politics of civil rights and the conflict in Vietnam were hard to separate from the immorality of war in general. Well, the white people have been taking us for a ride for the past 400 years in America. And the Muslims are straightening me up and teaching me the truth and saving my life so that I can see the hereafter. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us the religion of Islam, and I will die for it and give everything. But as far as taking me for a ride is concerned, I've been the one that was taking me for a ride and still taking my people for a ride as the white people. Tell me, champ, would you have been prepared to go into the army if it hadn't been, been for the Vietnam War? No, under no conditions do we take part in wars to take lives of other humans. At this time, perhaps paradoxically, Ali retained his WBC title and won the WBA title with two bouts that, more than any other, demonstrated his superb skill as a fighter and a ruthless killer instinct. He fought Cleveland Williams in Houston in November 66 and won in the third round, knocking Williams down four times. Again in Houston in February 1967, Ali at last met Ernie Terrell. The challenger had constantly taunted Ali, deliberately referring to him as Cassius Clay. Throughout the fight, Ali shouted at Terrell, What's my name, Uncle Tom? He put Terrell through a brutal 15 rounds and appeared to deliberately avoid knocking Terrell out to exact a maximum punishment. As he promised, Ali refused to step forward at his military induction in Houston on April 28, 1967. He faced court two months later, was found guilty of draft evasion, and began an appeals procedure that would last five years. He remained out of jail pending the outcome. Ali's successful defense of his titles against Zara Foley in New York City in March 1967 would be his last fight for the decade. He found himself stripped of his titles and unable to obtain a boxing license. In 1970, a state senator smoothed the way for Ali to be granted a license in Georgia. In October, he returned to the ring in Atlanta, defeating Jerry Quarry in three rounds in a non-title bout. The New York Boxing Commission was compelled to issue Ali with a license after a ruling by the state Supreme Court. Ali fought Oscar Bonavena, winning with a TKO in the 15th. The stage was now set for a shot at the WBA, WBC title against Joe Frazier. Some people say, you better watch Joe Frazier, he's awful strong. I said, tell him to try ban roll on. The bout generated huge interest, and the actual fight more than delivered on the promotional hype. Neither fighter had the upper hand until late in the 11th round, when Frazier delivered a devastating left hook. By round 15, Frazier had retained the title by unanimous decision. It was Ali's first professional loss. By April of 1971, Ali versus the United States had reached the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. The justices found in favor of Ali, and his draft evasion conviction was overturned on June 28. Over five years, support for Ali had grown as support for the war in Vietnam evaporated. I don't remember anybody except maybe Nathan Hale, who stood up one man against an entire government. Hale was hanged. Ali was acquitted by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that the Justice Department was wrong as a matter of law when it advised the State Appeals Board that Ali's beliefs were not religiously based or sincerely held. But Muhammad Ali had not only won in the Supreme Court, he'd won in the Court of Public Opinion. 
principled stand he had taken in 1966 was a risky one for any man, all but inviting condemnation from powerful and patriotic social and commercial institutions. It was even more of a risk for an African-American Muslim. Even today, ripples can still be felt in some corners of American society. When you look at what occurred here post-Vietnam and the naming of uh, Muhammad Ali Boulevard only passed by one vote, so there's always kind of been a love-hate relationship. There are people who embrace him, there are people who just uh, endear him to, to, the, to their side of thinking, but at the same time, you know, there's a scenario where there's kind of a core group of folks that vilify him to this very day. It would be easy to say that Ali's fame as a boxer led to his successful appeal. However, the opposite is probably true. His determination to be recognized as a conscientious objector showed a strength of character and depth of thought and reflection that stood as an example to others. At a time when many of his countrymen from all walks of life needed someone to look to, to help them decide for themselves what may be wrong in America and what was right in America. Ali bounced back from the Frazier fight, taking on Jimmy Ellis in July in Houston to win the vacant NABF heavyweight title, which he successfully defended against Buster Mathis four months later. I'm surprised Jim Mathis talks so much. I don't like fighters who talk too much. <laughs> but I predict that this will be Buster's last stand. I will do the Buster what the Indians did to Custer. I'm going to wipe him out. Ali beat Mathis and went on to win nine title and non-title bouts fighting in Switzerland, Japan, Canada, Ireland and the United States. At the end of March 1973, he suffered only his second professional defeat and lost the NABF title to Ken Norton in a 12th round split decision. He regained the NABF title in September in another bout with Norton and then traveled to Jakarta to win a non-title fixture against Rudy Lubbers. In January 1974, Ali and Joe Frazier would meet at Madison Square Garden. Frazier had lost the world heavyweight title to George Foreman, and the winner would have a shot at it. Both men were fined after a fight broke out on the set of a TV program in which Ali and Frazier reviewed their 1971 bout. Ali taunted his opponent about the length of their respective hospitalizations and built his pre-fight boasts around the need to take revenge on the man who'd inflicted his first defeat since Kent Green in his amateur days. Joe Frazier's in trouble, cause the Muhammad Ali Joe Frazier's gonna meet is gonna be better than the Muhammad Ali he met three years ago. Ali used distance to defend while maintaining a constant series of jabs, keeping Frazier chasing. At the end of 12 rounds, Ali was declared the winner by unanimous decision. He retained the NABF title, but more importantly, opened the way to challenge world champ George Foreman. They called it the Rumble in the Jungle, a fight familiar even to those without the slightest interest in boxing. WBA, WBC world title holder George Foreman would defend against challenger and former champion Muhammad Ali in Kinshasa, Zaire. Foreman and Ali spent time training in Zaire to acclimatize to the tropics. Ahead of the bout, the champ was regarded as the favorite. The Rumble in the Jungle was the now legendary Don King's first outing as a promoter of professional boxing. He'd negotiated contracts for an Ali Foreman bout promising a $10 million prize pool, but he didn't have the money. So the irrepressible Mr. King sought a government keen for international exposure to sponsor the fight. President Mobutu Sesseko of Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, was definitely interested, and the heavyweight championship of the world will be decided in Kinshasa. Journalist Eugene Kabala remembers those days in 1974. George Foreman was the first one to enter the stadium. He was a bit reserved. But he still tried to rev up the crowd. However, soon after, Muhammad Ali came in. As soon as he appeared, the public started shouting, kill him, Ali. Ali won by knockout in the eighth round after boldly employing his now famous rope-a-dope strategy, exhausting Foreman and turning his strengths to weaknesses. Muhammad Ali was once again world champion. I told you, all of my critics, 
I told you all that I was the greatest of all time. Wanna be Sunday? Listen, I told you today I'm still the greatest of all time. Ali successfully defended his WBA, WBC titles three times in the first half of 1975. In March, he faced the less fancied Chuck Webner, but the challenger really pulled one out of the hat and even managed to knock Ali down in the ninth round. Ali finally prevailed late in the 15th, and Webner's performance that night in Richfield, Ohio, is widely regarded as inspiring Sylvester Stallone's Rocky Balboa character. In May, in Las Vegas, Ali downed Ron Lyle by technical knockout in the 11th round. Two months later, he was challenged by then-Briton Joe Bugner. The bout was staged in Kuala Lumpur, and Ali won the 15-round affair by unanimous decision. The master showman had taken to suggesting that he could attack Foreman and Frazier on the same night. Joe Frazier and George Foreman in one night to solve all this stuff about who's the greatest. <laughs> I beat Foreman, he's got excuses. The cat was too slow, the rain was soft, and, and the canvas was all this stuff. And, and ropes are loose, and Frazier's talking about he's got a new punch now, and he's ready, and he beat me twice, but I barely won, or whatever. I want to beat both of them in one night. I want Frazier first for 10 rounds, and after I whoop Joe Frazier, I want George Fullman for 10 rounds, and I guarantee that I'll whoop them both. And after I whoop Frazier, whether it's a third round knockout, whether it's a decision or what, I want one minute's rest. I want George Fullman to jump right in the ring, and I make this statement to the whole world, all people watching in this interview. I'm seriously trying to get Joe Frazier and George Foreman in one night and to go down as the greatest fight of all time. Some of them still have doubt. They're making excuses. I want to work both of these men in one night and I'll have a record that nobody can touch. September 1975, Muhammad Ali is at his peak and preparing once again to fight arch-rival Joe Frazier. This third clash was promoted by Don King using a similar formula to the highly successful Rumble in the Jungle. This time, the venue was Araneta Coliseum in Quezon City in the Philippines. The heavyweights would face off in the thriller in Manila. It was an important fight for several reasons, many of which have become much clearer with the passing of time. There was huge anticipation for what was expected to be one of the greatest bouts on record. But even so, fans and the press were beginning to speculate on both fighters' plans for retirement. In many ways, it was also the end of an era for boxing. As the 1970s gave way to the 80s, professional boxing became a closed world of hardcore fans and pay-per-view screenings on cable and satellite TV, rather than a mainstream entertainment. And as the personable heavyweight stars retired, their place in the ring was often taken by boxers perhaps just as skilled, but whose lives had a harder edge and darker nature. There was also the suggestion that Ali's taunting of Frazier went beyond colorful showmanship and reflected a very real animosity between the two men. I'm going to do something to Joe Frazier that might be illegal. My lawyers told me to bring a bail bondsman to get me out of jail. They might put my tail in jail and get me out on bail after what I do to Joe Frazier. I'm going to do something to Joe Frazier. This will be such a good whooping, such a dynamic beating, such a superior whooping. I'm going to jab him. I'm going to box him. I'm going to hit him with left hooks, uppercuts, just like you and trainers. I'm greater than the sparring partners. So they punch him around daily. He's going to be straining and missing, and I'm going to be playing with it for two or three rounds, sticking him and sticking him. Use that long left jab. The fight lasted 14 rounds, with Ali the stronger in the early stages. But Frazier rallied, and his attack looked like it might take a toll on Ali, who had trained less rigorously than his opponent for this outdoor bout in oppressive heat. But by the 10th round, fatigue was getting the better of Frazier, and Ali was finding enough energy to turn the tide. His blows were swelling Frazier's eyes, leaving him open to yet more punches that he was increasingly unable to see coming. Frazier's trainer refused to let him continue early in the 14th round. Ali, the winner, collapsed on the canvas and had to be helped to his feet. He said that fight was the closest he'd ever come to dying. Ali successfully defended his WBA, WBC title six times through the course of 1976-77 against journeyman fighters like Richard Dunn and Alfredo Evangelista. 
However, these bouts, as well as his third encounter with Ken Norton, were a study of a fighter in decline. For the first time, the media began to discuss when Ali should retire, rather than whether he would retire. On September 29, 1977, he met challenger Ernie Shavers at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Shavers was never to win the heavyweight championship, but he's come to be regarded as perhaps the hardest hitter in the history of the classification. Ali was almost knocked out in the second round. At the start of the 15th, he was suffering badly. But the last minutes saw a classic Ali display, and he'd done enough to win a points decision and retain the title. In February 1978, Ali finally lost his crown to Leon Spinks, the Montreal Olympic gold medalist fighting just his eighth professional bout. They met again in September, and Ali won back the WBA title, becoming the first three-time champion. Spinks had been stripped of the WBC title for his decision to fight Ali again rather than Ken Norton. Muhammad Ali was now firmly established as a cultural phenomenon that resonated far beyond the ropes of the boxing ring. The media and the public may have been interested in other fighters' views on boxing, but they sought Ali's thoughts on politics, faith, society and life. It's hard to think of another athlete that so many have looked to in such a way. Mohammed, in the book you come over as a deep thinker, not simply a boxer. Is that how you'd like to be remembered? That's a good question. Uh, I am a deep thinker, but I don't think deep at various press conferences promoting fights. You have to think small in order to reach the average people. So I gave the people what they wanted. This is no jive. He shall fall in five. He will fall in five. If he don't fall, I'll leave the country. They buy tickets and line up for miles. Is he going to fall in five? What do you See, man desires to understand that which he cannot understand. First, he wanted to know what was on the moon. He spent $10, $15 billion for two rocks. Now, he don't want to know what's on the moon no more. Now he want to know what's on Mars. Ali retired at the age of 37 in June 1979, after the Spinks rematch. He was tempted out of retirement in October 1980 to contest the WBC title against Larry Holmes in Las Vegas. The nature of Ali's speech and motor skills prompted extra concerns about his health, and the renowned Mayo Clinic examined him as a condition of the Nevada State Athletic Commission granting a license. Ali was fit and at his fighting weight, but virtually motionless. Holmes thoroughly dominated until Ali retired in the 10th round, his only loss by anything other than a decision. Ali's last fight was a loss by unanimous decision after 10 rounds to Jamaica's Trevor Burbick. Muhammad Ali, 56 wins, 37 by knockout, five losses with only one retirement, in what's now regarded as the golden age of heavyweight boxing. Muhammad Ali's first wife was Sonji Roy. The couple met and married within the space of a month in 1964, but divorced in January 1966. In August 1967, he married Belinda Boyd. They had four children together, but Ali began a relationship with Veronica Porsche in 1975. She was with him in Manila, where he would sometimes introduce her as his wife. By mid-1977, he was divorced from Belinda and married to Veronica. Veronica is the mother of Ali's daughters, Hannah and Layla. The marriage ended in 1986. Ali fathered two other children in other relationships. In November of 1986, Ali married Yolanda Williams. She was originally from Louisville, too, and their mothers had known each other. Although Ali is some 15 years her senior, the couple have refuted the story that he was once her babysitter. She came into his life when his boxing career was over and symptoms of Parkinson's syndrome were becoming more and more evident. They have an adopted son. Layla Ali followed her father into the professional ring and has arguably become the best-known female boxer in the public's mind. She's also laid the foundations for a media career with assignments for several U.S. television shows. And she has her own confident way of dealing with reporters, perhaps inspired a little by her father. I train very hard, stay focused, and just get ready for another victory.
But perhaps her most widely seen fight, if it could be called that, was against her father. When contemporary shots of Layla were cleverly combined with archive film of Muhammad to create an innovative television commercial for sportswear manufacturer Adidas. Prior to the 1977 Ernie Shavers bout, sports journalist Jerry Eisenberg told Ali that he'd seen him in a recent television commercial and had trouble making out what he was saying at one point. Ali's Mayo Clinic assessment before the 1980 fight with Larry Holmes detected mild coordination difficulty in the muscles used when talking. Other agility tests at this time also indicated that something might not be quite right, but a conclusive diagnosis in such circumstances can be notoriously difficult. Ali went into hospital in August 1981 and July 82, complaining of some of the symptoms associated, though not exclusively so, with the onset of Parkinson's syndrome. By October 1983, his speech and movement had worsened and he developed a hand tremor. At this time, he failed special neurological tests designed specifically to indicate deficiencies in learning new tasks, thus suggesting the degenerative condition as the cause of the symptoms. At the height of America's involvement in the conflict in Vietnam, Muhammad Ali, a sporting fighter, made his views on real violence and the cost of war clear to a society that was still unsure of how to deal with such public displays of conscience. In 1994, the fate of some 1,800 Americans who were missing in action or presumed to have been captured during the Vietnam War remained unknown. Muhammad Ali traveled to Vietnam to help family members of those still unaccounted for establish new links and friendships with the Vietnamese people. Ali's second career as a globally esteemed ambassador of peace, dignity and understanding is as much a fulfillment of his boyhood dreams as were his world championships. From early on, it was clear that Ali's principles and character were understood and respected by people from different countries, different cultures, and different economic circumstances. It's almost as if everyone can identify with him in some way. He's obviously an inspiring figure for African Americans, for Muslims, and for the third world. But he's also admired by the privileged and largely white business elite of the Western world, while powerful politicians feel humbled in his presence. Muhammad Ali occupies a unique position in the hearts and minds of people across the globe, and he's never stopped trying to make the world a better place. Ali continues to support a long list of worthy causes in the United States, but has had a particular interest in the developing world, where people's lives are often dictated by a lack of educational and financial resources. In 1996, he made his first humanitarian visit to Cuba as the official presenter of medical aid worth half a million dollars. The visit also gave Ali the opportunity to catch up with his friend Chafilo Stevenson, Cuba's three-time Olympic heavyweight gold medalist. Tiene un gran corazón, siente mucho. Por lo demás, piensa mucho. He has a big heart. He has great feelings for others. He thinks a lot of other people. And that's what's important, his humanitarian and pacifist ideas. He returned to Cuba in 1998 on behalf of American humanitarian organization, the Disarm Education Fund, to deliver $1.2 million of medical aid. There are echoes here of Ali's stand on military service in the 1960s. The subjective relations between the United States and Cuba can excite passionate and deeply held expressions of feeling in America, particularly in government circles and among the large Cuban-American communities of Florida and New Jersey. Ali has put his humanitarian concerns first. In October 1996, Ali visited Indonesia and made an appearance at the Harapan Kita Hospital. However, on this occasion, the tour was sponsored by a food company that has its share of critics in North America. The association with the company drew a level of negative comment concerning Ali, rarely seen since the darkest days of his appeal against his draft evasion conviction. <laughs> 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 
Perhaps the association has tarnished Ali, as some have suggested. But then again, it's likely that a retired pro boxer, used to a world where the commercial hype of hard-nosed promoters mixes with a true belief of fans, would understand how to achieve their own aims in such circumstances, as long as they wish to do so. The United Nations awarded him the Ambassador of Peace Citation, and in that role, he visited Afghanistan in 2002 on behalf of the UN Children's Fund and the World Food Programme. Emerging critics have labelled visits such as this as mere photo opportunities, but the UN believes they have an intrinsic value, and Ali, a wealthy man who could stay at home, especially given his need to manage the ever-worsening effects of a debilitating disease, continues to do what he can. You'd expect Muhammad Ali to remain a respected figure in boxing circles, but uniquely, he's just as highly regarded by people far removed from the world of the ring. After all, bruising athletic competition isn't what springs to mind when you think of US singer Prince. My friend Londell McMillan called me a couple days ago and asked me, uh, he said, uh, Muhammad wants you to, and I said, yes. I didn't even let him finish. He could have said, <laughs> um, mow the lawn, and <laughs> I'd have been down with it. Um, Muhammad's my hero. Uh, he has been since I was a child. In 2003, Ali received a standing ovation from publishers and authors at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Such an enthusiastic and genuine welcome from those perhaps more academically than athletically inclined says much about the esteem in which Ali is held. He's more, much more, than a champion boxer. While in Germany, he was also reunited with Karl Mildenberger, the contender he'd fought in his sixth title defense in 1966. Muhammad Ali has dedicated his life since exiting the ring to highlighting what brings people together, not what sets them apart. Spreading Muhammad Ali's message of respect, hope, understanding and inspiration is the mission of the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville. The striking building in the heart of the city houses innovative and educational exhibits. Fight fans can follow Ali's rise to sporting greatness, but they'll also learn about what's really important to the man himself. From childhood to today, he, in anything for which he has confronted in life, he has stood tall and has fought the good fight. It's been more than 40 years since Muhammad Ali risked his reputation, his livelihood, and even his freedom but his standing is as strong as ever with visitors to the center. Just since I was a little child, me and my father, we went to the boxing matches and uh, always admire him as an athlete and uh, what he stood for in life. And after his boxing career was over, what he did around the world, uh, like an icon, like a president, he's just uh, done so much for everybody. I would like to uh, say that he's probably one of the greatest role models of all time, not only to his generation, but several on beyond. And in November 2005, a man who had faced imprisonment by his government four decades earlier was awarded his nation's highest civilian honor. The Presidential Medal of Freedom is conferred on those who have made an especially meritorious contribution to the United States, world peace, or other significant endeavors. It was perhaps a moment that marked out how a society can change within the frame of a lifetime. A month later, he became the 10th recipient of the Biennial Otto Hahn Peace Medal. Awarded by the United Nations Association of Germany, it honors those who've given outstanding service to the promotion of peace and international understanding. As a Hahn medalist, Ali's name is listed with notables like Mikhail Gorbachev, Karl Popper, 
Simon Wiesenthal, Miriam Makiba, and Mary Robinson. Ali recognized that he and Otto Hahn, a nuclear chemist, were both men who championed peace after excelling in fields that can have very real destructive effects. But long before the noble and prestigious honors, Muhammad Ali was awarded an iconic status in popular culture, celebrated through pinball machines, best-selling books, and countless photographs, posters, and prints on the walls of gymnasiums, sports clubs, workplaces, and homes. A 1975 documentary put his life on the big screen for the first time, and another, released in 1996, chronicled the rumble in the jungle. Then, in 2001, Hollywood released Ali, a big-budget film that begins when 22-year-old contender Cassius Clay beats Sonny Liston for the heavyweight championship and ends with 32-year-old Muhammad Ali regaining the title by defeating George Foreman. The title role was played by Will Smith, who was on hand for the London premiere. He was nominated for an Academy Award for Ali. I mean, anytime you have an opportunity to to wear the robe of greatness, you know, to to study, to define and, and quantify greatness, uh, there, there's always going to be certain aspects of your personality that you leave behind, and certain aspects that are are reaffirmed. Um, and the, the concept of Muhammad Ali's simplicity of his spiritual convictions. I think uh, that's the thing that really sits out most in my mind, how simple the concept of greatness is, how simple it is, but yet how complex and profound and difficult it actually is. Also at the London premiere was Henry Cooper, the Englishman who'd sent Ali to the canvas in 1963. He acknowledged the greatest by remembering the time Ali was felled by his famous left hook. It was nice to look down on him on one occasion, let's put it that way. <laughs> See, he was, uh, he was six foot three and up and he was always looking down on me. But on one occasion, in 63, I was looking down on him. So I always remember that time, yeah. yeah. Indeed, it's a man of rare qualities who's honoured by statesmen and showmen in equal measure. And Ali received that most sought-after token of popular acclaim a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame in 2002. This man stood for something and he was willing to risk it all. My father said, you know the measure of a man when he's willing to risk everything. And he Muhammad Ali made clear what his life had always been about. All my life, as growing up as a little boy, I always said if I could get famous, I'd do things to help my people that other people won't do. There's so many people who become famous and then make commercials, advertisements, and things which are not good for people. Well, I'd be Sunday listening for the World Championship that started my fame. I changed my name. That shook the world. Why did it shake the world? Because I took the name Muhammad Ali. A young boy in segregated Louisville, Kentucky, took what he did have and from an early age consciously used it to make his world a better place. A perhaps unique conjunction of personal qualities, circumstances, and the nature of the times meant that a thinking man with strength of character realized that he could use what he had to make the world a better place for others too. The Rumble in the Jungle and The Thriller in Manila attracted global TV audiences. Just as now, his words of hope, respect, and understanding resonate across borders and across cultures. A young Muhammad Ali dreamed of winning the World Heavyweight Championship and also of making people everywhere a little more mindful of our common humanity. He's achieved both. In 1980, after I fought him in October uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, we fought. And, you know, I didn't want, of course, I didn't want to hurt him because I knew I could beat him because I had learned the style over the years. And I went to his room and, uh, you know, we was all sitting around and I told him, I said, I love you, man. And the guy, it was such a nice guy, he had no hard feelings. I thought, I love you, man. He said, well, if you love me, why do you beat me up like that, then? <laughs> he influenced a whole lot of people, black, white, whatever color you want to say, he influenced them. And, and 
It's because I'm every champ of the world. It's because of him. I have more photos of Muhammad Ali hanging in my home than anyone else, including my family. And my favorite is the one that he autographed to me. It's a picture of Ali standing in the ring in Lewiston, Maine, after he knocked out Sonny Liston. And it says, to Madonna, we are the greatest. <laughs> and I have to agree. <laughs> I remember it, 76, 77, Muhammad Ali just took out a free day, just came and visited us and talked to all the kids. Must be a couple of 1,800, 2,500 kids that's in this reformatory. And he took the time to talk to all of us. What makes him the greatest fighter is that he simply had skills that exceeded anyone's expectations. The fastest, the best, the most positive, and they'll never see the likes of him ever again. He is exactly what he seems to be. There are no pretenses here. He's a very loving man, very kind man, very generous person, but he's also very sure of who he is, very comfortable in his own skin, and always free to be Muhammad Ali. For whatever reason, Muhammad Ali today is this magic man, really. I mean, if God hadn't made him, I think somebody would have invented him. I am the greatest.